Romans chapter 8 verse 6 For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. For to be carnally minded is death is a profound statement that delves into the heart of human existence and our spiritual priorities. Being, quote, carnally minded speaks to a mindset consumed by the flesh of our inherent sinful nature. A carnal mind is a mind that is dictated by the flesh. It is a mind that focuses on the here and now. It is a mind that does not take into consideration God's word and God's command. And the world we live in is full of people with carnal minds. They live each and every day for themselves. They live their lives to please themselves and not God. A carnal mind does not merely allude to physical or sensual desires, but it digs deeper, highlighting a mentality anchored in worldly values. These worldly values often manifest as materialism, the relentless pursuit of sinful pleasures at the expense of moral integrity, and the prioritization of fleeting pleasures over lasting virtues. This mindset also breeds self-centeredness, a pervasive focus on one's own needs, desires, and ambitions, neglecting those of others. Such self-absorption not only strains interpersonal relationships, but is also a leading factor in marital breakdowns, causing divorces due to an inability to compromise or consider the well-being of a spouse. This is one of the major problems in our society. People have a carnal mind, and they are worshiping at the altar of self. They are their own God. They are their own savior. They are self-centered. They are narcissistic. Being in a relationship with a narcissist is horrible. This is one of the major reasons divorces are on the rise, as narcissism is on the rise. Take your eyes off yourself and your sinful desires and place them on God. Rather than focusing on yourself, focus on your family, focus on your children, focus on your spouse. A carnal mind is why people commit adultery. Several studies and surveys have tried to quantify infidelity rates, with estimates generally ranging between 20% and 25% for married men and women. That means one in four married couples cheat. A carnal mind will lead a man or woman to risk their marriage for fleeting pleasure. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 32, But whoso committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding. He that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. The carnal mind. Have you ever seen the sorrow of a man or woman who has destroyed their marriage because of adultery? It is a heartbreaking thing to witness. It is the carnal mind. What is holding you back today is the carnal mind. To be carnally minded is to oppose God's design and desires for humanity. When Paul refers to death in this context, he isn't just addressing the inevitable physical end we will all face, but underscores a far graver concern, spiritual death. This is a harrowing separation from God, a chasm that distances one from the rejuvenating life and the transformative rebirth that stems from an intimate relationship with the divine. Romans chapter 8, verse 6. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Being spiritually minded entails a conscious alignment of one's thoughts and actions with the guidance of the Holy Spirit. It signifies a deep-rooted commitment to living in sync with God's desires and principles. This is when you begin to love what God loves and hate what God hates. This alignment isn't just about the mysterious or heavenly aspects of spirituality. It is deeply entrenched in our everyday actions, decisions, and interactions. In simple terms, your life is ordered by the Bible. Your actions are ordered by the Word of God. Your thoughts are ordered by the Word of God. Your speech and the words you speak are inspired by the very Word of God. Being spiritually minded means that your mind no longer dwells on the cares of this world. For being spiritually minded, you understand the fleeting nature of the world we currently live in. You truly grasp the brevity of this life we are living and the fragility of human existence. You recognize that you are not on this earth by accident or mere chance. An intelligent being created you. Therefore, if an intelligent being created you, it only makes sense to follow the commands of your maker. 
you understand that you have a maker, a creator, who will one day judge you for your actions and every one of your thoughts. When an individual is spiritually minded, their approach to life transcends mere rituals or religious acts. Their approach to life transcends mere daily routines. Their eyes actively shift off this world and all the cares of this world. Unfortunately, a lot of the churches today are carnally minded. They are focused on this world. They are focused on the here and now and not eternity. So many churches are seeker friendly. They are only concerned with getting people into their church and not heaven. Your church should be pointing you to eternal life. Your church should be pointing to Christ and to eternal things. A spiritually minded person is looking for eternal things. This is one thing Satan wants the churches of today to be. He wants them to be carnally minded. He wants the Christians of today to be carnally minded and not spiritually minded. For if you are a spiritually minded person, you are a changed person, a transformed individual. A spiritually minded person is transformed in many ways. One of the ways in which they are transformed is through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Unfortunately, a lot of people think that you only have the Holy Spirit if you can do some great and mighty thing that is visible for the masses to see. However, the Bible gives us clear evidence of what the fruits of the Holy Spirit are in an individual's life. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such, there is no law. A spiritually minded person is a transformed individual. It becomes a genuine reflection of God's teaching and principles in the practical world. Such individuals are driven by love, showing compassion and mercy in their interactions, seeking justice in their dealings, and consistently striving for righteousness. Righteousness and holiness are a priority in their life. They live an intentional life. For to live a holy life, you have to live an intentional life. They see beyond the temporal and material, recognizing the larger divine plan and purpose. Their eyes are on eternity. Their focus is on the endless ages they will spend with their Lord. They live each day as a testament to their faith, making choices that resonate with spiritual wisdom and understanding, thereby illuminating the path for others to follow. Beloved believers, if ever there was a time for us to embody the fullness of what it means to be a spiritually minded Christian, that time is now. For it is written, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. To be spiritually minded is not a mere religious claim, nor is it about wearing a mask of holiness. It is a call to genuine transformation, a call to walk as Christ walked. It is the heartbeat of a soul that has truly encountered God and decided to be changed by Him. To be spiritually minded means to refuse the trappings of hypocrisy. It means to denounce a double life where one's confession on Sunday does not align with the actions of the weak. It is a grave error and one which our Savior repeatedly warned against to claim the name of Christ and yet walk in the ways of the world. The duality of such a life may fool many but it cannot fool the one who searches the heart and tests the mind. This form of godliness denies its power and becomes a stumbling block to many who are genuinely seeking the truth. In a world teeming with distractions, it's easy to lose sight of eternity, to become entangled in the fleeting pleasures of this age, to prioritize the material over the eternal. The allure of the carnal life is ever before us, beckoning with its false promises and fleeting satisfactions. But we are called to a higher standard, a heavenly mindset, one that values the eternal over the temporal. Let us remember the profound truth that our lives here are but a vapor, and the real essence of our existence lies in the eternal. I implore you, beloved, let the Word of God be your guiding light. Let it order your steps, govern your speech, and transform your thinking. Refuse to be a believer who merely goes through the motions, who prioritizes rituals 
over a genuine relationship with the Father. The spiritually minded Christian understands that the essence of Christianity isn't about doing, but being. Being transformed, being renewed, being like Christ. Such believers recognize their role in this world as ambassadors of Christ, sent to shine His light in dark places. However, let it be clear, this call isn't about perfection, for we all fall short, but it's about a genuine heart that, when it errs, runs back to the Father, seeking His forgiveness and grace. This journey of being spiritually minded is a continuous process, a daily laying down of our will and taking up the cross. It's about letting the Holy Spirit, not the flesh, lead. In this age of superficiality, where fake news and fake lives abound, may we be genuine believers who live authentically, who refuse to wear masks, who refuse to be lukewarm, who refuse to mix the sacred with the profane. May our lives in every facet echo the truths we profess, not out of obligation, but out of a deep-rooted love for the one who first loved us. Let's stand firm, dear believers, Let's be that city on a hill, that light that cannot be hidden. Let's refuse to be Christians who merely talk the talk, but walk the walk, illuminating the path of righteousness for all to see. Let the world see, not us, but Christ in us, the hope of glory. The call to be spiritually minded is urgent and pressing. So let's rise to it, embracing the transformations it brings, living with an eternal perspective and being the genuine reflection of Christ's love to the world. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 5 Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. Those who display a form of godliness are those who outwardly show religious behavior, they appear to be godly, but it is only a facade. Their religion lacks true power, as seen by their unchanged lives. They talk about God, but continue to live in sin, and they are content with this lifestyle. So, what is a simple definition of godliness? It is living in a way that reflects the character of God, obeying His commandments, and seeking to honor and please Him in all areas of life. An even more simple definition of godliness goes as following. Godliness is not sinning. Godliness is not sinning. How do we know Jesus was godly? Because he lived 33 years on this earth not sinning. Who is the godliest person in your church? Well, it is the person who sins the least in your church. Who is the least godly person in your church? It is the person who sins the most. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9-10 through 10. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. I can confidently say this about Jesus' time on earth. He did not try to be like other people. He did not try to be like the people of his time. He did not try to be like the people in the Old Testament. Jesus did not try to fit into a place. He was unique. Jesus created a path, a new path, a path towards eternal life that we can still follow today. Jesus did not come here on earth to fit in. He spoke the truth and only the truth, and the world hated him for that. And if you are speaking the truth in this world, the world will also hate you for that. The world hated the Lord. How can a world hate the one who came to save them? How can the world hate the Lamb of God? How can the world hate the one who everything he did was for others? Jesus Christ and the world hated him. How can you hate him? He is the one who went to the cross and died for us. He suffered the horrible and brutal death of the cross. 
He is the one who sweat, as it were, great drop of blood in the garden. He is the one that walked on water. He is the one who was baptized in the river Jordan. And a voice from heaven said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. He is the one that healed the sick and raised the dead. Everything he did was for the good of mankind. And this world hated him. Jesus did not try to fit in. And I am here to tell you that if you are a child of God, you don't fit in too, and you must never try to fit in. This world encourages sin. It endorses sin. That is the truth we live in, a sin-endorsing world. The ethics and the morality of this world is different to the ethics of the Bible. As a child of God, you do not conform to this world. As a child of God, you conform to the Word of God. We all know the God of this world is the devil. Therefore, we know that to agree with this world is parallel to agreeing with the devil. As a child of God, you need to expect your worldview to be different to unbelievers. That's why you don't fit in, because you are not governed by the world. You are governed by the Word of God. And for this very reason, the world will never love you or accept you. John chapter 15, verses 18 through 19. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. In other words, what Jesus is saying is that if you are like Jesus, the world will hate you. And if you are not like Jesus, the world will love you. It is a pity that so many churches today in the world are trying so hard to fit in. These churches just want to be accepted by society. They say that they do it in the name of love and inclusion for all people. But is it really love to lead your whole congregation onto the train of destruction? Compromising on God's standards of morality in order not to offend anyone? Leaving out parts of the Bible to suit their needs? Leaving out parts of the Bible in order to be inclusive? Now, our Bible in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5, tells us that there are a group of individuals who have a form of godliness. This group of people will be left behind during the rapture. And when they are left behind after the rapture, a percentage of them will be shocked that they are left behind because in their minds, they were Christians. And a percentage of them will not be shocked because they know that the way they have been living is against the Word of God. The truth is, you know that God is, and you know that this same God who is, is the same God who made you. You know that God is eternal. You do. You know that God is invisible and omnipresent. Therefore, you know that God is watching you. And you also know that on one day, God will judge you. The truth is, some of you have God's laws, you have the Bible, you know the Bible, but yet you do not do what the Bible says. That right there is what is spoken of in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. And remember, the simplest definition of a godly life is not sinning. A godly life is not having a secret addiction that no one knows about. A godly life is not having a secret life that you are doing your best to keep hidden. A godly life is one life. A godly life is not cheating on your husband. A godly life is not cheating on your wife. A godly life is not engaging in dishonesty or deceit, whether it be in personal relationships or business dealings. A godly life is not driven by selfish ambition or a relentless pursuit of personal gain. A godly life is not characterized by a lack of integrity or a disregard for biblical moral values. A godly life is not marked by harboring bitterness, resentment, or unforgiveness towards others. A godly life is not consumed by materialism and the relentless pursuit of wealth and possessions. A godly life is not defined by engaging in sexual immorality. The godly will continue to live in obedience to God's word remaining faithful and steadfast. Their lives will be marked by love, 
humility, and devotion to Christ. On the other hand, the ungodly will persist in their rebellion, indulging in worldly desires and rejecting the truth. They will be blinded by their sinful pursuits, unaware of the impending divine intervention. Now, what is godliness? Godliness is not a mystical quality. It is not a vibe. Godliness is not about whether you can preach or whether a person has any public gifts. The godliest people can be garden day variety saints that no one knows or listens to. Don't ever make the mistake in believing because someone has a great following or has a big platform or a mega church, that person is godly. Godliness is not about performing miracles or performing wonders. Godliness is not sinning. Godliness is, it is living in a way that reflects the character of God, obeying His commandments. It is not living a double life. It is not living one life for when people are watching and completely different life when no one is around. That is godliness. The gospel message is simply this, come as you are. However, the gospel message is not stay as you are. Come as you are and be born again. When was the last time you heard a sermon about the new birth? John chapter 3 verses 5 through 8 King James Version. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, Ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth, so is every one that is born of the Spirit. Jesus said, you must be born again. This is something that everyone on earth must do. Why? The reason is that everyone born into this world is born into sin, and no one can escape the power of sin except they go through what is called rebirth. It is a pity that so many churches today in the world are trying so hard to fit in, and they have forgotten that God called them a royal priesthood. They have forgotten about their uniqueness, and now all they care about is accommodating the rest of the world. If you go to such a church, I encourage you to find another one which preaches and teaches the true gospel and not a watered-down, sin-accepting one. The Bible says in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Don't even try to be like them. Do not model your life after theirs. There are so many things that we are bound to face in this world, even as Christians. It doesn't matter how hard we pray. It doesn't matter how much we read our Bible. These things will surely come, but how we respond to them is what matters. Before you start feeling discouraged or hopeless, Remember that God will never leave you. Jesus was talking to his disciples about what they will face in the world. John chapter 16, verse 33. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. God will not forget you. God will always be there. He has separated you from the world. He has brought you into his kingdom and you have been saved. You should never allow the devil to make you feel unimportant in this world. Others may be doing different, immoral, and sinful things that are giving them money or fame. Do not compromise your faith for money. Do not turn your back on God just to gain fame and be loved by this world. 